there's often a core fear and my biggest core fear since childhood has been that I'm bad Mm -hmm. that I'm secretly bad that I'm inherently bad that um I am secretly some evil person doing awful things or will do awful things and that I just don't know about it yet okay okay one two ready Welcome to the Called to be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin, and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, you know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call, and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hi, Katie. Hi, Mariah. I'm really excited to be here with you. Me too. Welcome to Call to Be Bad. Uh, So this is Katie, Reverend Katie O'Dunn. Pronoun she, her is the founder of Faith and Mental Health Integrative Services, which is an organization uh, helping individuals with OCD and related disorders live into their faith traditions as they navigate evidence-based treatment. Katie is proud to be an IOCDF lead advocate. And what is IOCDF? The International OCD Foundation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, An ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and an endurance athlete tackling 50 ultra marathons for OCD. Holy cow. That's... (laughs) I have one in a week and a half, so we can (laughs) chat about that too. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so 50 ultras, 50 states, but each one I'm raising money for one person, and I'm doing it with um, no CD, who's matching it with me, so we can cover treatment for two individuals in each state um, that wouldn't be able to afford treatment otherwise. Wow. Okay. Oh, so cool. Oh, my God. (laughs) All right. So, um, obviously, the topic today is on OCD and faith, and so I'm very excited to get into that. Um... I don't know a ton about OCD as far as mental health goes, so I'm very excited to learn with you, uh, Katie. Um, But first, let's talk about our drinks. And I've heard that you have a special water bottle to share. Yeah, so I have have two things going on over here. I always have some sort of fun coffee cup because I love coffee. And um, if y'all know, there's always pink on everything I do, which is, um, I'll talk later about why, but that's kind of an exposure for me. And I'll talk about what that means in the context of OCD. But then I also have this really awesome water bottle here that I just got from um, Jack Mental Health Advocacy and Natural Life. And it's their really cool fearless connection um, about overcoming anxiety and moving towards all of the things meaningful to you. So lots of fun drinks going on here. Yeah, nice. And I picked my mug um, kind of unironically, kind of ironically. So I have I have coffee today and it's um, I just got new beans and just ground them this morning. So it is like the like prime coffee and um it's oh i wrote it down too so i could share it's um the uh equal exchange coffee brand and it's bird of paradise that's the not flavor but i don't know that's what it's called and so i picked an eeyore mug (laughs) yours actually my favorite like literally my favorite Mm -hmm. i knew somehow (laughs) and um eeyore is on there and then on the back it says smile and so, okay, I love Eeyore too because, I mean, it's Eeyore. Like, Eeyore's just great. But I also picked it because, like, I feel like a lot of people who struggle with mental health, they are met with um, frustrating kind of, like, platitudes. Like, have you tried smiling? Have you tried just not worrying? Have you tried, you know, like, as soon as people say, like, why don't you just? Or, I was just going to say, why don't you just pray a little harder? Right, yes. <laughs> so I love Eeyore and like, it's cute. So like, yeah, that's kind of why it's like ironic, but also not because I also like Eeyore because <laughs> Eeyore is just great. And um, like all of Eeyore's friends just like hung out with him. And even though Eeyore is Eeyore and he's kind of like a rainy cloud and kind of just like glum, they they don't try to fix him. They just, they just hang out with him. So how do you use the term OCD? What does it stand for? How do you use it, et cetera? 
Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll, I'll say both what it's not and then what it is, because I think sure. a lot of people hear the, the media definition. And a lot of times in the media, we hear OCD defined as this cute quirk, right? And yet there is nothing cute. There is nothing quirky about OCD. Um, we often hear it used as an adjective with saying someone is so OCD because they like to do things in a particular way or organize things. This is totally <laughs> different from what the actual disorder is. So OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and it's really a debilitating disorder defined by unwanted obsessions that terrify the sufferer and compulsions that are really completed to alleviate the fear, the guilt, or the anxiety that come up. Um, some of those obsessions might relate to things that folks are, are more common um, or, or more used to seeing um, on TV, like contamination or organization but others can relate to more taboo or violent or sexual themes. Um, those are just as common for sufferers. And really the significant piece is the themes that stick are those that are the most important to the sufferer. And mm -hmm. um, themes related to OCD are always what's called egodystonic. So they go with, against the desires or the wishes of the sufferer. So it's not mm -hmm. someone enjoying the obsessions that they're having. It's literally taking something that is important to them twisting it and making them worry about it. Um, it hijacks their mm -hmm. values and really morphs them into their worst nightmare. And then the compulsions come up as individuals try to make sure that that thing they're obsessed about isn't true or isn't going to happen. Um, and it, really the piece I always like in defining OCD to let folks know is that on a biological level, we all have thoughts, right? We all have mm -hmm. happy, sad, weird, strange, whatever thoughts. Um, our brain likes to produce all sorts of different things as we interact with the world. But those with OCD tend to place more value on those thoughts and become really, really concerned with thoughts that are meaningful to them and with thoughts that oppose their value. Um, so that's an initial definition. Um, and really with OCD, we, we classify it as, as a disorder when it starts to impede the person's functioning. Um, and that's really when it crosses over when those obsessions and then the accompanying compulsions begin to really take over life to a certain degree. Mm, yeah, that's so interesting. I didn't know the element of it takes like your values, like what you hold most dear and then kind of turns that, that that's devastating. It's devastating. And an example for, for folks listening that is actually incredibly common that you don't hear a lot about is um, postpartum OCD. Um, mm -hmm. this, this comes up a lot for, for new moms where, um, or really for, for any parent, quite honestly, I hear this very frequently where OCD will take the love of their child and they'll start to question, well, do I really care about my child? Am I, am I secretly a bad mom? Does that mean that I shouldn't be around my child? Am I okay? Do I need to like make sure that I'm not a bad person? So making you question your own identity and even if you are the things that you think and that you hope you are to the point that it can really separate even parent from child because these amazing parents are so concerned that they might be a danger when they're not because OCD is hijacking and twisting those values. So can OCD tendencies, is that something, man, I don't, I really don't know where it comes from. Is like, is it, is it genetic? Is that something that comes up environmentally? Like how, where, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually a hotly debated topic. Um, mm -hmm. I was just giving a talk last week um, at Salesforce on OCD and I reached out to a group, a bunch of clinicians to actually ask and I got about 15 different answers. Um, so it's still a debated thing. Typically what, what we'll say is that um, there is a genetic component to mm -hmm. OCD, but then there is is also um, kind of an environmental component where typically someone will experience something where OCD might might kind of come out for them or might latch onto a particular theme because of something they experience. So kind of a both and, but it's something that is still kind of debated. Um, but the, the positive thing is that regardless of where it comes from, OCD and the treatment really isn't about diving back into the cause. It's about mm -hmm addressing um, the themes, the obsessions, the compulsions in the here and now. And it's actually considered one of the most treatable disorders in existence, which is really cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I'm just going to keep saying that over and over. The <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Oh. Hello, beloved baddies. 
A quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul, a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of Edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change, laughter that brings us together, and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. I was just going to ask if you could give an example of a typical obsession and then the compulsion that might come with it. Would Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll give kind of two two different areas because these are, um, well, I, I guess and I'll, I'll say this too. With OCD, the content is totally irrelevant. For the sufferer, it doesn't mm-hmm. feel like that because it's latched onto what's important to them. So they'll always say, oof. I would be okay with an obsession about anything else except this, but it's just because that's whatever their value is. Um, but I always tell folks the obsessions are just different gross ice cream flavors of the same gross ice cream. It's all OCD, just different obsessions. Um, so an example for two different people might be, um, let's see, one obsession that you might hear more commonly is something like, um, what if I left the stove on? What if I left the door unlocked? And the compulsion around that would be maybe going back to check or taking a picture to make sure that that's off and continuing to do that in a repetitive fashion. Um, Another example that might be sound really different, but is really the same kind of process that's taking place is somebody saying, um, you know what, what if I hit someone with my car and didn't know about it. What if I hit someone with my car and somehow blocked it out? Um, And the compulsion would be going back to particular streets or reading news reports to make sure they didn't unknowingly do something quote unquote bad, um, which we'll we'll talk about in the the context of of this podcast. Um, And some of those, then some compulsions for folks are totally internal. So we would call that rumination or mental review where you might have a particular obsession about what if I did something wrong, what if I'm a bad person, or even related to faith, which we'll get into a little bit more, and the compulsion might be going back through your mind and trying to think back to events or trying to prove to yourself that you're not all of the things that you fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, just for, for folks who are listening, and this is something most people don't know, I didn't know this really until I started working in this area, that there are lots of obsessions with OCD. There are lots of different subtypes, but actually a really common one is religious scrupulosity. Um, And religious scrupulosity is a subset of OCD where the obsessions relate to someone's particular faith or to their particular religious beliefs. So you might have an obsession, um, what if I'm not good enough. What if I am sinning by doing this? What if I am not praying in a way that's right? What if I'm not engaging in this particular ritual properly? And the compulsion could be engaging in things repetitively, um, engaging in things where you are consistently asking for reassurance from clergy or from religious texts. And it takes on, I know everyone has a form of questioning, but it takes on really an entirely different form for religious scrupulosity where it takes over someone's life and it no longer is about the faith. It almost becomes about worshiping the OCD um, Mm -hmm. where there's no longer joy or meaning or purpose derived from faith. Rather, it's all about fear and anxiety and trying to prevent feared consequences from God. Um, So the work I do now, which I'm incredibly passionate about, this is something that comes up across faith traditions. Um, I work alongside treatment teams um, for OCD, supporting clients, navigating religious scrupulosity across faith traditions and help separate what is authentic faith from what's OCD um, and developing treatment plans and supporting someone to reunite with their faith in a way that's authentic and meaningful and inclusive and helpful rather than in a way that's um, driven by their illness. Right. So religious scrupulosity. So do you think um, that, okay, so I, I, I'm working with like a, a theory that I just came up with right now. Yeah. So like a lot of mainstream Christianity feel, is very fear-based. Mm-hmm. If you don't do this, you are going to hell. If you don't do this, God will be mad or whatever. Like we use that language or, or like 
the concept of, of Satan or demons, like a lot of that, uh, um, the rapture, like that's terrifying. Yeah, totally. um, so do you think that, you know, that kind of fear-based faith, does that feed into some of the this religious scrupulosity? Like if, if, if Christianity were not like that, I mean, probably the obsession would be, become about something else, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, what, what do you do with that? Yeah. Yes to all of those things. I could talk for a lot. This I am so passionate about this topic. Well, it's still um, the the rates are really similar across faith traditions and and how mm-hmm. this comes up. But kind of what we were talking about earlier that generally someone is predisposed to have OCD, but it might pop up in a particular area that's significant to them. Um, not there. There isn't really necessarily research with this right now, but I'm interested. There's a, there's some studies that are happening around this that yeah. there's sometimes the rigidity of a particular tradition. OCD is more likely to perhaps latch on to faith within that. So if there's a tradition that black and white thinking is happening anyway, and that it's very much, you're good, you're bad, you're going to hell, you're not. If someone has OCD in that congregation, their OCD is probably going to latch on to that. Um, and I know... A lot of clients I work with also that have religious group also come out of situations of religious trauma um, where that gets really looped into their OCD, where yes, they probably would have had OCD that showed up with a different subtype anyway, but the faith piece has really really fed that. Um, And then it's really hard to break down because I'll work with folks um, where you know, the scrupulosity has taken over their life and they'll say, but everybody in my faith tradition is really scared. And it's like, well, but it's taking, it's taking it for, it's, it's a different way with yours because you're, but it's because of your disorder, but it's, it's really hard to sometimes break that down for folks and to encourage, um, I work a lot on theological flexibility and still helping someone to live into that tradition in a way that's meaningful to them, but recognizing their level of functioning with that fear-based component is very different from others in their tradition. I mean, I, I work with folks that because of their scrupulosity, they will leave a spouse that they love very much because they're having, having an obsession that God no longer loves their spouse. I mean, it's like literally at life altering situations. Yeah. But yeah, it all rolls together. And um, I, I'm really interested in research around how um, particularly inerrant views of scripture and rigidity and religious trauma might fit with, um, with OCD and religious group. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. If you do research on that, let me know. I would, oh, I would read that book. Oh my goodness. I would. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, honestly, there isn't a ton out there on this topic and, um, I mean, every client I work with around this, my heart breaks because Mm -hmm. they're struggling with this disorder that's sometimes being reinforced in a congregation. Um, And it's, it's really tough. Yeah. Not to mention, like, I, I, I don't think that, you know, purity rituals, you know, are, are, are inherently bad or wrong or anything like that. But if you throw in contamination OCD and then you have things like communion or foot washing or, you know, anything like that, I, I could see that or, or praying to, you know, like create in me a clean heart, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, or, and, or like sexual sin and purity and purity culture, like. Oh, the, the sexual sin piece comes up for me every day with folks I work with, but then. <sighs> Even the, the purity rich rituals around washing, even outside of Christianity, I work with so many Muslim clients that mm-hmm. really, really struggle with that, where it's, okay, I feel like I have to ritually wash mm-hmm. like 60 times because I don't feel like I'm clean enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how has OCD played a role in, in your faith? You know, how, how, what is kind of your journey with OCD and, and, and share share what you want, you know. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm pretty open. So for me, my earliest OCD symptoms are, are most likely, honestly, even before I can remember, I can remember mm-hmm. 
being in elementary school and walking around my house and feeling like I needed to touch objects in a particular order so that something horrible didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being in school and learning some fact about the sun potentially getting too close to the earth and something horrible happening to everyone. And I felt as a five and six year old that it was personally my responsibility, though irrationally, to touch objects in a particular way so that the earth would not get too close to the sun mm -hmm. and that I was protecting humanity. Um, that was a lot of responsibility for a five or six year old to feel like I'm the fate of the world rests in my ability to do mm -hmm. things perfectly. Um, and that's really where it started for me. Um, a lot of harm themes for me started coming up um, in over responsibility when I was eight and my aunt died of cancer and I assumed it was probably my fault and started doing obsessions around that as an eight year old or started doing compulsions around that as an eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, and my family took me to my first therapist, um, who was a talk therapist. And unfortunately, talk therapy, while effective in, in other spaces, is not particularly effective for OCD and can actually make the condition worse. And I didn't get better. I didn't see any relief. But as somebody with over-responsibility, I pretended to get better because I wanted my therapist to think he was good at his job. And I was eight and afraid he would lose his job if I didn't get better. So pretended, oh, I feel great now. Everything's fine. Went back to school um, and continued kind of getting sicker throughout my life. Um, there are different ranges of, of how folks with OCD function. I was somebody who was incredibly high functioning, but spent most of my life engaging in mental rituals and compulsions while I was living. So nobody had really any idea how far it went with me. Um, really, it started to spiral, particularly as I got into my early 20s, late in college and early in seminary. I was a Division I runner and then moved into um, Emory um, at Candler School of Theology for Divinity School and was really succeeding externally, but internally just crumbling. I was getting to the point that I wasn't sleeping at night because I was spending all night checking ovens, stoves, and locks, driving back to churches where I was interning to make sure candles weren't lit, to make sure that nothing bad would happen, um, feel, taking really total responsibility for every aspect of everybody's life. Um, and I finally told a mentor at this point that I thought I might have OCD. And um, unfortunately, I was told that because of my role in ministry, because I was pursuing ordination, that it would not be in my best interest to seek treatment or to let anyone know because I wouldn't pass my psych evaluations. So I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I have lots of thoughts about that now too. And I speak out very openly about that. Um, oh so I, I got significantly sicker. I actually lied on all of my psych evaluations. I was kind of smart enough to be able to see anything that related to anxiety or OCD and put something different. Um, and yeah, I mean, so ended up in my first role in ministry where I was a school chaplain to 2,700 awesome kids from different faith traditions. And as OCD likes to do, it started to latch onto every single thing important to me. It latched on to my morality, latched on to mm -hmm. my students, made me question every aspect of who I was, made me feel like a dangerous person. And I ultimately um, kind of hit rock bottom with um, a series of traumas and tragedies that I was walking with students through with their own mental health struggles, where I was in the midst of losing kids that I cared very much about. And my OCD very much blamed me for that. Um, so I was supporting young people as a minister through their own mental health struggles and my OCD was twisting it in some different ways. So I hit rock bottom, ended up having to seek evidence-based treatment really for the first time and was thankful to find someone amazing in my area who is still a mentor today. Um, and that very much saved my life. I was still functioning highly, working with students during the day, doing intensive treatment at night where nobody knew. And then I came out of that experience and for the first time, didn't want to be quiet about my story anymore because I had all of these amazing kids I was working with from various faith backgrounds who were keeping their own mental health struggles a secret to not share with their faith communities. And I felt like I had a particular obligation to say, okay, <laughs> I'm your chaplain. And actually, I've been in mental health treatment too, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And there is no shame around that. 
Um, so I started coming out about my experience for the first time. Yeah. Oh, I can, uh, man, I'm sure those students felt so seen because I feel like there's, there is this, uh, unfair pedestal that religious leaders get put on that they are perfect, can do no wrong, you know, have never struggled ever. And then how unapproachable would that be, you know, to people who you're supposed to be walking with in their spiritual journeys and then for them to find out like oh my chaplain also had, has OCD like that's amazing that's that's so that could be so validating and helpful um rather than like oh I'm I'm pissed at that board who was or whoever said to like hide that like oh that makes me want to scream yeah. um like okay <laughs> like how dangerous to say, like, no, don't say that. I mean, I'm sure they were thinking they were looking out for your career, but, yeah, that's really messed up. Well, um, and now, because I do a lot of support groups, actually, for clergy who are navigating mental health struggles, and I am I always tell folks, you know, you to be open and authentic about who they are, and if you're working with a particular body or a denomination who doesn't want you to be who you are, then that, necessar- that isn't necessarily your space, right? Like, it's... Yeah you should be able to be who you are. There should not be shame around that. And I, I was scared when I started coming out about my story because mm-hmm. I felt like these kids, these families see me as, yeah, this religious leader. And like yeah. you said, on a pedestal and what are they going to think of me? And it was the opposite of everything that I had thought my whole life. For the first time I started hearing from families saying like, oh, wait, we can actually talk to you about what's going on. How do we have a conversation with our priest or our minister or our rabbi or our imam? Like, let's let's do this thing. And started helping kids get into residential treatment and all sorts of things, um, recognizing things that were going on with kids in school and having them be open about it. Um, So it was, for me, such a powerful shift and then ultimately kind of got me to doing work around faith and OCD full time, which is really mm. my passion and my love and really what I believe is is my vocational call. Yeah. I love that when, pe- when people find their niche, when it's like, oh, and that just like matches up. That's, that's really exciting. We had talked um, on, on Instagram a little bit about you coming on and then I was looking through your feed to kind of get a, get a, um, a handle like on your work and like learn about you more. And I watched this video and you were sharing about when you were little, um, somehow you latched on to this idea of uh, that you were bad, that you were, that you, that even though like you on the surface seemed like a good person, like really deep down you're, you're bad, you're, um, a bad person. Like what if you were secretly a bad person? Um, and I was like, oh my goodness, that fits with this podcast so well. That's almost eerie. Um, yeah, so so can you share a little bit about this good bad dichotomy and how that has affected you? Yeah, no, a- absolutely. And and for anybody listening with OCD, you might feel very much the same way. This is actually one of the most common things that comes mm-hmm. up. We are used to hearing about anxiety around OCD, but often guilt and shame are <laughs> even more mm-hmm. prominent and it for so many people relates to how they view themselves and this fear that they're secretly something horrible, that they're not who they think they are um, in the midst of this good, bad kind of black and white dichotomy. Um, There's often a core fear and my biggest core fear since childhood has been that I'm bad, Mm -hmm. that I'm secretly bad, that I'm inherently bad, that um, I am secretly some evil person doing awful things or will do awful things and that I just don't know about it yet. So going back to childhood, that manifest in me calling my parents into my room at night um, and they would call them worries and it made no sense to them. I was getting the citizenship award at school and they would come in and I would say, I had these thoughts and like, I'm really scared that I'm a bad person. And like, what if I grow up and kill people and I'm just really bad? And I'm like five and six. My parents are like, I think, I think you're good. Like, you're, you're fine. And I'm like, no, but really, like, I'm, I'm worried. I'm, I'm worried that I'm just, like, inherently bad. I wouldn't say inherently. I'm sure I had a different right. one. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> right. But. That would be, impre- be impressive as a five-year-old. But no. Yeah. No. <laughs> but I really, I really felt that. And that was something that, again, feelings aren't facts, but that carried with me throughout my OCD experience, where regardless of – anything that I would do, even as a minister, it was 
no real logic behind it, but what if I'm secretly quote unquote bad? And I don't know that I even had a definition for that. It was just this idea of, well, there's, there's good and there's bad, and I must somehow be in the bad category. Um, and that was a, um, a big component throughout my life until really I sought treatment. And it's still something I struggle with, but being able to find more of the gray in humanity mm -hmm. and recognizing that it's not about being good or bad. It's about being authentically the person that God has created me to be in this moment and doing the best that I can with that as I continue to share God's love with others. Mm, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I just want to like hug little you. You know, like, I just, do you do any, like, any inner child work with stuff like this? You know, like, um. Yeah, so treatment for OCD really f actually focuses on not necessarily going back. It focuses mm -hmm. on the current obsessions, compulsions. I have done some trauma work with, with some other stuff that intertwined. But um, I think for me, the biggest inner child component, um, and I've talked to a lot of folks in the support groups I lead about this too, and folks really seem to resonate with this, is, um doing advocacy and the work that we do for the younger version of ourself and thinking, mm -hmm. okay, you know, where was I before I knew what any of this stuff meant or why it was going on? And it giving me a space to turn pain into purpose and mm -hmm. advocate for younger me um, and the other kids and the other folks that I see that I'm working with that sure. are at a place that I wish I would have had somebody in my life. Mm -hmm. So, um, why is it beneficial to focus on what's happening now versus like you said before, like it's not, you don't necessarily need to go back and find the root or like the cause of your OCD. What, 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 why is that helpful? Yeah. So, um, the, the gold standard evidence-based treatment for OCD is, um, exposure and response prevention or ERP. And it falls under the umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy and really focuses on, um, <laughs> taking um, your obsessions and, um, well, I'll, I'll explain that and then I can say kind of why it goes back. So the, the ERP sounds like a really scary treatment actually when I explain it. It's making you face your obsessions head on without mm -hmm. engaging in those compulsions um, so that you actually will develop with your clinician a hierarchy where you're facing all of the things that you're afraid of. You're intentionally raising your anxiety and you're letting it be there without doing the behaviors that would make that anxiety go away. So if you're afraid that you left the stove on, you might actually leave the stove on for a little bit, stare at it, turn it on and off, and then walk around your house and not check it, all sorts of things. If you're afraid of being a harmful person, you might write a narrative about what that looked like if you were actually a harmful person. Mm -hmm. You might, there, there's all, it can take lots of different forms. With religious rituals, it might mean doing something imperfectly and not saying sorry for it, not going back and checking on that. Um, and for folks who have never done ERP, it's literally the anxiety level of someone sticking a bear in front of your face and saying you should just sit there and not do anything about it. <laughs> it's, it's actually a pretty um, tough treatment. But the flip side is it's really effective from a research um, perspective. It's one of the most effective treatments. OCD is one of the most treatable illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is over time, someone habituates and they're able to sit with that anxiety that comes up and it doesn't cause the same level of distress. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you stop having obsessions or intrusive thoughts. You just no longer get stuck on those and are able to see them as kind of faulty wiring in your brain. Um, mm -hmm. The reason that becomes the focus as opposed to going back is Folks with OCD, it's considered a doubting disorder where logic actually doesn't necessarily help. It's really this faulty alarm system. And when you go back and try to figure out, well, how did I get here? Why did I get here? You end up going deeper sometimes into that rabbit hole of trying to figure things out where figuring it out doesn't actually change anything about the wiring of the brain in that moment. So it can almost become its own obsession of figuring out what is the root and then. Oh, totally. And it can become compulsive of, I'm going to go back and try to remember every single thing I did at this point in my life, and I'm going to pick this apart and then it's going to be the solution. And I've been there. I've, I've gone down mm -hmm. that road. It's why 
sometimes folks who end up in particular types of talk therapy with somebody who doesn't know OCD Mm -hmm. um, get sicker because it becomes an obsessive and compulsive cycle in and of itself. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, The neat thing with ERP and ACT um, is used alongside it a lot is you actually, they've done before and after MRI scans and you actually can rewire the brain where you really are fixing the problem, which is, which is kind of cool. Along with ERP, medication can be really effective for, for OCD as, as kind of this, these two pieces that go in tandem. And I know that sometimes for folks taking medication or who are asked to take meds, there can be an element of shame. I have been there, but there does not need to be. Um, it really can actually help you as a part of your treatment if you're working with a psychiatrist and figuring out what works best for you. Um, and there's a quote by Viktor Frankl that says, between stimulus and response, we have a space to choose. Um, and with OCD, I think sometimes that space to choose, to choose how we respond to our intrusive thoughts or our obsessions can seem really, really tiny. It can feel like there isn't really a whole lot of a space to choose. Mm -hmm. And the medication, um, I think makes that space a little bit bigger so that people can actually use those skills and tools that they've worked so hard to develop. Yeah, that's neat. It's, that's so hopeful too, that, um, that the, that OCD is so treatable because it, it sounds so devastating and so life altering. And so to hear the hope of like, yeah, this is, this is scary. This is traumatic. And there is, there is something we can do about it. There's Um, so much hope. There's literally so much hope. (laughs) Yeah. So I've heard you use a language of like fighting OCD, um, but, but you were saying, but it's never like something that you ever complete and like, it's done. I'm done with the whole OCD thing. Uh, do I have a question there? I don't know. Um, like, is there such, so I guess I'm comparing it to anxiety in my head. And one thing that I have noticed is if I accept, you know, like anxiety as part of my life, versus kind of struggling with it it is it has been beneficial so so yeah what it what does that fighting language kind of mean to you yeah it it's it's interesting because the, the even when i say we're fighting our ocd it's often by not actually fighting with which is uh, um which is, which is like, like on the oh. podcast how bad is not bad <laughs> yeah. like that kind of yeah okay. it's interesting the fighting often is letting the thoughts be there and uh, continuing to live and not engaging in things around it. Um, so I use the term stick with the ick of okay. letting the, letting the icky thoughts or feelings or emotions be there and mm-hmm. not doing anything about it. And that actually be a form being a form of fighting um, your OCD. And there isn't a cure for OCD, but by doing that every day, you can live a really awesome, full, joyful life just by leaning into uncertainty, sitting with that discomfort and, and sticking with the ick. Um, yeah. Um, so I follow uh, someone online that does a lot of OCD work. Um, but one thing that she has said before that I really love is that discomfort is not danger. That you can be – and that, like, you have experienced discomfort before. You will experience it again. And it's not – yeah, it's not, it's not dangerous. No, and I love that. And it's so, I mean, discomfort, it's its really what OCD is all about. It's mm. we're uncomfortable, but it doesn't mean, like you said, discomfort is not danger. We can mm. sit with all of it, and that's how we move towards our lives. Yeah. You had talked about um, earlier about how pink somehow played a role oh. in your, um, what was it, EFT? Is that what it is? Oh, ERP. Yeah. ERP, sorry. ERP. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah so what, 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 was, what is that for you? Yeah. Um, so for a long time, because of feeling like I was bad, mm-hmm. I didn't think I deserved to experience joy. So mm-hmm. it actually became a compulsion for me to um, not allow myself to be happy, which comes up for folks sometimes, to not allow myself to have fun or to wear things that I liked because I felt like I didn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. Um So for me, one of the biggest exposures um, came in the form of giving myself permission to experience joy and to wear things that I thought were cute. 
and were happy. And it was actually really scary for me at the beginning because I felt like I didn't deserve it. And now that's become a part of my life and a part of who I am and a part of fighting back the o with from the OCD. Um, pink is my favorite color. So it's giving myself permission to like, I have a pink snail on my wall and like a pineapple with pink sunglasses. Like, and I even have, let's say I have like my rainbow unicorn cat. It's like <laughs> giving myself permission in everything that I do um, to wear pink, to wear things that I like, to, you know, experience joy um, mm -hmm. as an exposure. Um, so I ask everyone who comes on, on the podcast, what would you say if someone told you you were a bad and like insert whatever identifier here? So a bad reverend, a bad chaplain, a bad person even because of your advocacy and care of OCD. I know that um, in some Christian circles, like mental health is not a thing. It's just, I don't know, demons or spiritual warfare or something. Um, yeah. How would you respond if, if someone said something along the lines of that to you? Yeah. Um, I think Earlier on in my life, I would have curled over and been like, oh, you think I'm bad? I'm horrible. And then a little bit later on in life, I would have gotten really mad and been like, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And now I'm at a place that um, I think I have an understanding because this does come up pretty frequently with folks not understanding mental health, that it's actually about their own stuff and it's about their own experience. It's about maybe their lack of understanding but also maybe something that they're navigating that they're not ready to accept. Um, mm -hmm. They're feeling that they, I don't know, need to need to have certainty or can't have a mental health disorder is impacting the way that that they're they're seeing me or my experience. So uh, mm -hmm. now I would respond with an opportunity to educate and say like, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so I disagree with you. Here's why. Here's some great resources on OCD and also give them them permission to be authentically them. Um, mm -hmm. I always like to tell folks in those situations, um, I'm not going to try to change your mind. I'm going to give you some great resources. And please know that if you are ever struggling, you still you still have a space. And um, I am happy to be with you on that journey. And it's it's really interesting. I've had folks who have not initially said really great things about me in ministry because of my work in mental health that down the line have come back and reached out and said, I'm actually really struggling with my mental health. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. um, and I think remembering that sometimes that's where they're coming from in that space and just not ready to accept it. Um, it can be really important. Mm, so the, the frustration, the resistance to all that you are and stand for is coming from their own struggles with, with mental health. Yeah. Um, that kind of reminds me of people who are um, very loudly homophobic. I was just going to say, yes. Being closeted themselves. Yeah. yeah, we speak out of our own struggles, our own experience. Yeah. So is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you wish, like if you could have the world on a platform in front of you listening, like what would you tell that, what would you tell people about OCD if you could have everyone's ear? Yeah, um, OCD isn't an adjective. It isn't a cute quirk. It's a debilitating disorder. But there is so, so, so much hope um, through evidence-based treatments like ERP. And you, regardless of, of where you are and what your OCD might be saying to you right now, if you are in that space of shame or guilt or anxiety, um, there is really effective treatment and you can live a big, beautiful, awesome, joyful life with OCD and you deserve to live that life. Final thought for today, I always like to leave folks with the fact that faith and mental health do not have to be mutually exclusive. And I'm really big on the trinity of faith as a part of treatment, that you can have faith in the divine, faith in yourself, and also faith in your treatment all at the same time as you move towards this big, beautiful life you were created to live. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. I always, I always end with a blessing, but then people like with their final thoughts often like have their own blessing and I'm like, oh, I have nothing to add. That was, that was perfect. Um, yeah. Wow. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I, man, it's, I don't think it's an, un, I don't think it is an overstatement to say that you are saving lives with the work that you are doing. And I just, 
yeah, I really commend that. And also, um, Katie has a really, really awesome Instagram, so I'll link that below, but go check her out there. Um, Katie, would it be okay if I bless you and all of our baddies out there watching and, and listening? Okay, Katie and all you lovely baddies, um, may you go from this episode knowing that you deserve to experience joy, that if you are struggling with mental health or OCD specifically, that there is hope, um, there is are steps that you can take to health and wholeness and know that every step of the way, uh, may you uh, walk towards your values and know that you are loved and good and bad and beautiful. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. This has been such an honor. You're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Katie. This is, this is so great. That's all for this episode of Called to be Bad. Keep being your bad, beautiful selves, and I will see you next time.